experience working today. So um, the last couple of questions on the warm-up were just a, a little bit about terminology, and I neglected yesterday to go over them. Um, what I was doing here is applying the term at large for the Senate, and that's um, typically not where you see it apply. It was just my convenient excuse to work that term in. Typically where you see at large is more in the local and state level. Um, I'm sure you've seen signs, kind of campaign signs before. Someone's running, you know, at large, and you, and you know, at large is what we use when there's a criminal kind of, you know, on the loose, or there's some sort of behemoth uh, that's in your neighborhood. That thing is large, right? Um, what does it mean in this case? Well, if you think about, you know, Georgetown only has two districts, really, or two wards, um, and you, you, the representation is is not. Newburyport, perhaps, is a better example, uh, where they have kind of a city mayor and, and uh, a different kind of form of local government. And what you see is there are wards uh, that are represented within city government, um, but there may be a person representing Newburyport as a whole. So we call that person at large. Instead of representing a small uh, geographic area within the city, they represent the city as a whole. And that's what we mean by it at large. Um, so technically, if you think of senators, they represent, you know, you've got uh, congressmen, representatives who represent all the different districts, and then the senator's job is to represent the state as a whole. So, you know, again, you don't normally call a senator at large, but the concept fits. That was my convenient excuse to work that in. Um, the other thing I had was delegate. If you notice, there's 435. You know, you know that. You don't have to notice it. Uh, there's 435 representatives. Um, each of the 50 states is represented in terms of population, with the exception of D.C., um, with the exception of Guam, with the exception of uh, Puerto Rico. Um, there are territories, and, and D.C. has its own kind of special classification, that are part of the United States. Um, and the question is, if you don't have full statehood, should you have kind of full representation? A delegate is kind of a hybrid. What a delegate is is someone that is able to represent their territory or the District of Columbia, um, they get to go to committee meetings, they get to serve in committee meetings, they get to speak on the floor, um, they get to do pretty much everything a representative would do except vote. So they can kind of steer the, the conversation and the debate, uh, they can put their input in, but they don't get the vote. So that's what a delegate is. Um, all right, so I've cleared up those kind of term, uh, terms. Uh, again, where we left off yesterday is we were looking at the numbers. And uh, for the Senate, the number is fixed. For the House, the number is fixed. What isn't fixed is where people live. Uh, people move frequently. I feel like there's a national average of people move once every like seven years on average. Um, so if, you're, if you've, you know, if, I know my parents have had the same phone number for 48 years. Um, that's kind of, that's rare in, in uh, nowadays. So that means uh, there's somebody else out there moving every, you know, 30, 30 minutes to kind of cover my parents. Um, so keep in mind it's an average, but we move fairly frequently and that causes population shifts. What's the thing that we use to kind of measure the population? We get the, it's the census, right? Really kind of fascinating to look at. So online you can look at census reports and it's not just how many people there are. Um, it's the ethnicity, it's the religion, it's the income. Um, they survey attitudes. They get um, a breakdown of the American public that is really kind of impressive. Um, so if ever you're looking for kind of data, <laughs> if you're trying to understand, uh, you know, what, the, um, what exactly it is we look like, a snapshot of what we look like, that's a great site to go to. So they do a census. Um, once I've done my count, what I may discover is that some states have shrunk in terms of population, others have grown. Um, it may also be, too, that certain states have grown quicker than others. I'll show you that again in a second. Um, that math matters because what it means is if I don't uh, adjust how many representatives each state has, some people are being overrepresented and some people are being underrepresented. And we're going to get to today this idea of one man, one vote. Um, if we are guaranteeing equal protection and the same kind of privileges and immunities, everybody's vote should count the same. And that means, you know, the math needs to work out, all right? So if the census indicates there's been a population shift and I need to kind of resort uh, the number of representative states have, what do we call that? Close. That's the third step. Did you say it? Realignment. Close. So the word portion is in there. 
So that may be helpful. Obviously, we're kind of figuring out which, you know, what kind of portion is yours and which kind of portion is somebody else's. It's called reapportionment. And then once I've kind of said, okay, you used to have 12 representatives, now you have 11, I have to do what you just said, redistricting. And that's to redraw my lines, right? That's where we left off yesterday um, in terms of um, the sequence, right? Census comes first, then you resort the numbers, you, re you give everybody a different portion, and then you redraw your lines. Now, um, the census, uh, you know, I just kind of picked this as a... Um, uh, little visual here to help you understand that it's pretty sophisticated that, you know, um, you may picture just people coming and knocking on doors and obviously that is part of it, but that's almost like a last resort where they're really wanting to get, you know, there are people reluctant often to just kind of share their data uh, and maybe understandably so. So they have a lot of um, mechanisms that you kind of see here where they try to use technology first um, and then they uh, try to take a more targeted approach to these non-response follow-ups. Uh, they try to minimize the amount that they have to do. And um, you kind of see a, a list of strategies that they have there. So again, I encourage you to go to the site, um, census.com, uh, and what you can see, again, is once they've done their count, how, many, how often do, do we do a census? Ten Every 10 years, right? So once we've done the census, and there's, they do kind of... Um, mid-cycle reports and other things like that. So they're always giving you data, but the big census comes every 10 years. And what you see here is gained and lost and no change. But what you notice is, um, it, you know, if you, if you did a study a little more closely, Massachusetts didn't lose population. We just didn't keep pace with the growth that was elsewhere. So it wasn't like people were moving out of our state. We just weren't having, um, uh, like I said, population growth that was equivalent. So as a result, you have to redistrict. Um, it seems simple enough, but I want to show you, you know, I thought that this was one of the more striking kind of uh, maps to show you some redistricting. Um, what you have here is initially seven districts, and you've got to come down, uh, I think they did it to six. So I've got to go from seven to six. And what's interesting is, look, you, you kind of look at District 5, and all of a sudden what District 5 became. And it, it, it's almost non-contiguous. It makes this, you know, jump. Um, District 2 becomes something, again, kind of coherent to some sort of abstract blob. Uh, you know, District 3 shifts over to where District 7 was. In, but it's only, actually it's a little larger, but not as north and south. So it's kind of crazy how they redraw the lines. Um, there's some human geography to this. You don't just follow, uh, you know, physical geography. You follow the human geography, and hopefully there's some sense to this where... Um, it makes sense uh, in terms of, you know, some sort of regional identity. But uh, we know that this can be used in an abusive way, right? What's that practice called when I use redistricting in, a, in an abusive way to give somebody more power or take away? Gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, right? And that comes from Massachusetts great Elbridge Jerry and a salamander, right? Uh, which to me always looks like a dragon. I've never seen a salamander look like that, but... Gerrymandering probably sounded better to them. So this is where you're drawing those kind of odd-shaped boundaries. And what you're doing is you're favoring one group by kind of, you know, increasing, um, you know, the demographics that you want to in, in that particular district. And you're decreasing um, the, the power of uh, other groups. So this is uh, the practice. And what I think is helpful, and I've shown you this example before, is to just kind of think of a conveniently square or, or uh, rectangular state that, you know, obviously has more blue, whatever, Demo you know, we call them Democrats, I suppose, versus Republicans. That's a convenient use of the color scheme, but make it whatever you want. You know, white and, and African American, uh, white and Hispanic, uh, low income and high income, uh, whatever you want to kind of do in terms of a demographic. And what you realize is if you had to create five districts, there's three different options that skew the results. So I can kind of, you know, look at, well, there seems to be a, um, uh, a, a two to three ratio here. Right? You know, there's, uh, we, should, we should have kind of, if we're going to kind of keep consistent with what the uh, higher numbers are for the blue population, we should give them three districts and, and the, um, the red should get two. But I can maximize the blue districts by going vertical. Uh, or I can do this crazy zigzag and actually give the red 
uh, an advantage. So that's you know it in theory, but what we are going to see is it's done quite a bit in reality. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, um, you know there are there is a slight advantage in terms of political identification for Democrats versus Republicans. Um, on average, there's you know about. Uh, 3% more that identify themselves as Democrat versus Republican. What you may be surprised to find is there's a heck of a lot more people that identify themselves as independent, right? However, everyone says they're independent, but they lean, right? You know, it, it rarely do you find somebody who is a blank slate um, and doesn't have some sort of political preferences. So when you get these people who are independent to uh, identify their leanings, what you see is still that like 3% advantage, I'm holding up four fingers, um, that 3% advantage that uh, Democrats have in terms of identity versus Republicans. What that says is if everybody turns out, if you can get your population to turn out, Democrats will have an, uh, an advantage in most national elections. And these numbers often play out, um, they don't play out state to state, but you, you would, you're going to see in a second how... Um, they still have numeric advantages in some places, but it doesn't translate into control of the House or the Senate, right? So again, they should have an advantage in um, national elections, and often they have an advantage in state elections. But what this graph is showing you, um, and it's from Mother Jones, which is liberal leaning. Um, so you could find other graphics that maybe challenge this, but I deliberately picked the graphic that showed you how they show you that both Democrat, Democrats and Republicans do it. Right? They both use this strategy to their advantage. And again, picture you're, you're sitting in a test and they give you this graphic and they say, what's the trend? So what's the trend? What's the graph showing you? you got one hand. Are the rest of you sweating bullets or do you see it? There's always the cubes here. So share the popular vote. Who, let's do one of the more obvious ones. Are more people in this line in Wisconsin, Democrat or Republican? Democrat. Yet, who got more seats? Republicans. Okay? Do you see how to kind of read the graph now? Um, what you, and, you know, again, it's pretty consistent here as well. Um, you're going to see that both sides do it, that their share of the population often exceeds uh, their, um, excuse me, their, uh, share of representation often exceeds political identification. And it has a lot to do with the fact that they have stacks and districts, okay? Um, so that's um, where it's deliberate, where you've gone and you've drawn lines deliberately to give you an advantage. <coughs> There's a series of, I would say, they're important cases because this is where I'm going to get the terminology one man, one vote. Uh, but I think understanding the concept uh, and the basics of the case are what you need. Um, and what's funny is, uh, I, I think Gray versus Sanders is a little more important because that actually has the impact. And this is more about jurisdiction. Um, so I guess if I was going to prioritize, you really should know Gray versus Sanders. But if you just know the concept, um, I think you're going to be okay. What you see in both scenarios is a population shift with a failure to redistrict. So in... in um, in both cases, you know, I've got one in Tennessee and one in Georgia. I have uh, increasing urbanization. I have uh, a decline in rural population and an increase in urban population, but no corresponding redistricting. So what it means is people in the rural areas are being overrepresented and people in the cities are being underrepresented. And we're going to challenge this. Is this, you know, in um, uh, violation of... Again, the 14th Amendment, think about how important it is. It's saying that no state shall interfere with your equal protection, with your due process, with your privileges and immunities. Can I think about representation um, as any of those kind of concepts? So, and I think certainly you can. Um, what we do in Baker versus Carr is we simply uh, affirm that this is a federal matter. You know, is this one of the reserved powers of the states to determine its own districting standards? Um, and what the federal government weighs in on is just the uh, issue of jurisdiction, that um, federal courts can't avoid these types of cases. In Gray versus Sanders, we affirm that um, a failure to redistrict is a violation of the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. Um, put more simply, what we come up with, like I said, is the one man, one vote law, uh, a rule 
that you know equal protection means nothing if everyone's vote counts differently. Okay, do we get those? All right. So um, what I'm kind of doing is just doing a lot of look at the structure of how we, um, you know, the, the mechanics and the numbers of Congress. Um, you know, I've looked at the election require, you know, the kind of the uh, uh, formal and informal requirements to run. I've looked at the numbers of, uh, in terms of how long they serve and how many there are and how we kind of uh, organize districts. Uh, I want to talk too about like what happens if you got to fill a vacancy. You know, I've got people in now. What happens if they drop out? Um, you know, for any variety of reasons, whether it was health, uh, you know, a, a, an untimely death, or whether it was, uh, you know, they were removed, uh, there was a voter recall, or they resigned. How do you fill um, vacancies? And again, what you're going to continually see is that there's a distinctive kind of difference between the House and the Senate based on the numbers. You know, it makes the chambers um, have different kind of functions and have different kind of values. So, you know, in the Senate, you lose a senator. Uh, the, the two options that you have is the governor can call a special election or the state may have given the governor uh, the power to make an appointment. The logic to giving the governor an appointment, well, what do you think it is? Why would we avoid an election? What do you think, Kai? It's faster, it's faster right? And, you know, think about elections in terms of uh, economics. What else are we doing if we just have the governor appoint? Saving money, right? So it's, it's more immediate and we're saving money, okay? Um, there probably has to be some, you know, planets aligned, though, for the state legislature to give the governor this kind of power. What do you think I'm hinting at there? You know, you know, what would you expect? When, in what scenario would a legislature actually kind of say to the governor, yes, we trust you to go ahead and make this appointment? What would you think about the makeup of both the legislature and the governor? What do you think, Ben? Is it part of the same party? Yeah, you got to have them probably the same part of the same party. And you're going to see in a minute the kind of a game of cat and mouse that happened in Massachusetts, where um, a Democratic legislature had a Republican governor, and they were like, uh, "We don't want you to have that power," so they removed it. And then, you know, times change, and all of a sudden there's a Democratic government governor and a. a, a a senator that had died, and we're like, uh-oh, let's give it back, right? So it's an interesting kind of, there's politics behind this. There's the rule, but then there's the politics behind it. Wasn't that Scott Brown? Yes, so I'm going to show you the kind of the sequence here in a second. Um, so in the House, what you have is, um, you know, some parallels, but, you know, we've got some, um, some different options that are kind of surprising. So the governor can call a special election, but most states often leave the seat vacant. Now, that seems crazy. But again, it comes down to numbers. Why would you leave the House seat vacant, but you know, make sure that you have a senator? Think numbers. What do you think, Jack? Most states have only two senators. But so, more. what percent of your representation are you losing? Fifty percent. But a state like California? They lose two percent. Yeah, they lose like two percent of their representation. All right. So that's one reason due to numbers. What's another reason? that should say, we gotta get somebody, we can't leave a Senate seat vacant. We can leave a House seat vacant. Who's gonna be in an election? Yeah, so this is, this is leaving something <coughs> vacant potentially for five, maybe, you know, if they're, if they're died within the first few moments of their, uh, you know, after inauguration, and uh, they, 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 uh, they don't wear a jacket and try to act robust, right? You know what I'm, you get me? Um, so, uh, you know, you might have a vacancy for six years where this, there's an election right around the corner with this one. So, you know, again, this is not just abstract. So you mentioned the kind of the scenario. Um, in 2004, you had Mitt Romney come in as governor. He's a Republican. He ran as a Republican candidate for president. So you probably recognize him. And he won. All right. Uh, so the Democratic legislature at this point thought, well, that's, you know, we, we have always kind of had, not always, but because there was Weld and there was, um, you know, we, we do have this interesting tradition in, in Massachusetts of being a, a seemingly liberal state, but we like divided government, uh, and we often are, are okay with Republican governors. But the Democratic legislature was a little nervous, and they took the power of appointment away from him, but then in comes Deval Patrick. And uh, Kennedy, the, the lion of the Senate, he had been there for about 48 years. Um, so uh, Ted Kennedy, who was the brother of Jack Kennedy, uh, John Kennedy, the, the president, 
um, and you know, uh, has this distinguished political career, he's ill um, and uh, terminally. And so with a knowledge that uh, his days were few, uh, Kennedy actually kind of, you know, talks about, look, it, you know, if you're going to give the power of appointment back to Deval Patrick, the, a, a Democratic governor, I just want a temporary appointment, and the temporary appointment can't run for the permanent appointment. I want you to hold a special election. So that's what you end up seeing happening. You know, who's this guy, this dour-faced individual? <laughs> that's Kerry, right? He was our other, um, uh, he was actually the junior senator, uh, it served like 40 years at this point, um, I think he, he got close to 50 years as well. What did he go on to be? What is he currently? Secretary of State, uh, although his days are waning, right? Um, this is Kirk. That's the temporary appointment. So what we end up having is the temporary appointment, uh, and Kirk was um, connected to the Kennedy family in, in a number of ways. Uh, what you have then is a special election, and you mentioned Scott Brown uh, running as a Republican, and it was a very kind of surprise upset of, does anybody know? That's Martha Coakley. I don't know if you remember what she was. State yep, state state attorney general. And everybody thought she was going to win, uh, but in the end, Scott Brown wins. And he pulls this kind of upset victory. Had a lot to do, too, with this kind of Tea Party um, conservative movement. And he, he capitalized on that. The reason it's really significant is because in the backdrop, Obama has come into office. Um, and he has Democratic majorities. And he's got a mandate to, well, he doesn't have a mandate necessarily. It wasn't necessarily one of the campaign um, platforms he ran on, but he did run on the idea of reforming health care. And so we have um, a Democratic majority and a plan for health care that almost gets scuttled by the election of Scott Brown. Because what it does is it gives um, the Republicans what is known as uh, a cloture proof majority, not a majority, but a cloture proof uh, minority. In the Senate, you have the ability to filibuster, um, and you can filibuster endlessly, and it's typically a power that the minority branch uses to protect against the tyranny of the majority. Unfortunately, where we've seen the filibuster used a lot was like to block civil rights legislation. But the, the, the idea is if the majority is doing something abusive or wrong, the minority still has some sort of tool in the tool bag to fight that. They can filibuster. They can capture the floor and hold it indefinitely um, and force the other side to give up. There is a tool, though, to end a filibuster. And what it's called cloture. And cloture, you need uh, a two-thirds majority. So if two-thirds of the Senate say, hey, we want to end this filibuster, they can't. That's 66. So if you have 41, excuse me, that's, you need 66. That's 60. You need 60 votes to end a filibuster. So if the other side has 41, you're never going to break a filibuster. You are cloture proof. Does that make sense? So they had to reform health care. Um, what ends up happening is in the next election cycle, which wasn't that far off, um, Scott Brown loses to Elizabeth Warren, your current uh, senator. And then he goes off to New Hampshire and considers other kind of races and is still occasionally in the mix, right? So a little, little Massachusetts history and a way to understand that filling vacancies isn't uh, an abstract. Uh, any questions on that? So um, now that I've got kind of my um, numbers populated, I want to talk about the kind of the work cycle that they work in. So we're still looking at structural things. And what you're going to see is that they have almost like an academic calendar in, in, in a sense. They have terms and sessions. So you guys have academic years and quarters. And, you know, think about it similarly. So they're going to have uh, a division into terms and sessions. Their terms, you have one-year academic years. They have two-year uh, academic years. They have two-year cycles. And you have quarters. They have essentially semesters, I suppose. They have, um, uh, uh, you know, they have a, a first session and a second session. Now, when they used to historically begin work was on March 4th. So they would get elected in November. They wouldn't start till March. What's the logic to that? We got to go 18, 1800s logic, though. You got to get there, and it's difficult to get there. So this was largely for travel time. The problem is, though, that let's say I am an office holder and I am voted out in January, but I don't leave office till March. 
what kind of a legislator do I become? I, and I always use the scenario with you guys, like, let's picture Mr. Hastings got fired. They finally, they watch the videotapes, they realized I'm a raving lunatic. Um, he's talking nonsense out there. We got to get him out. So I get fired. Uh, it's November, but I'm not leaving till let's say um, April. What does the class look like? What's your level of respect for me at this point? I say, hey, turn this in, and you go, eh, yeah, right? Um, I ask you to do something, and you're like, listen, you're, you're, you're gone. You're not uh, an authority anymore. So what do I do? I start looking to see, will this come off the wall? Can I, can I take, what kind of electronics and materials can I take with me? I've become a lame duck. Um, this is, you know, essentially the term for people that are no longer politically effective. Um, typically, you see with presidents, for example, they become lame ducks really, you know, if they're serving a second term, it's like the second year into their second term. They're lame ducks. Obama's managed to maintain a level of um, popularity. Uh, he's managed to get some um, deals through, including climate change uh, deals that are kind of remarkable in the waning days. Typically, what you see with lame duck is no one's listening to them. And so they pass a series of, of self-serving legislation. They go on spending sprees. So for this reason, they bumped up the date. You know, uh, elections are still in November, <coughs> but we've got a quicker transition date of January 3rd for the inauguration. And that's a product of the 20th Amendment. I always took a duck and did it kind of a dead duck with the, the X's and the cart, you know, the eyes, the cartoon kind of symbol for dead. Uh, but he's not dead, he's lame. It works for me. Uh, I'll give you that mnemonic, okay? Um, so what I showed you in one of those graphs was like a 0 to 114. We've numbered every Congress um, from the first Congress to now. And we're currently on the 114th. We're about to go into the 115th. One of the interesting things, I think, to kind of look at is, you know, I'm going to get you guys to start going to the sites, and you're going to be amazed as to how transparent Congress makes itself. So they're going to tell you, hey, this is exactly what we're up to. This is how we voted on things. Here's the current legislation. Do you want to watch us in session? You know, a, a lot of people kind of complain about government, but they do it from a largely kind of uninformed standpoint. They don't realize that this government makes itself incredibly transparent, and as they do, that's a tool for you, and you can use it to become more informed and more active and hold them kind of accountable for things. Um, so one, I just wanted to show you the splash page, if I'm calling it the right thing, right? But really what I wanted to show you was there electronically is an indication of that we're in the 114th Congress, the second session, and what will happen on January 3rd is it will switch electronically. We will immediately kind of transfer power to the new Congress. Not that there's uh, been a massive democratic, uh, demographic shift in terms of uh, majority minority party, but if there was, it's amazing. Like same thing happens with the White House page. It just switches. Um, and that's one of the signs that we've had a transition to power. Um, swearing in on the Bible and the, um, you know, having people take the oath of office is another way, but I always find it kind of fascinating to look at it like that. <coughs> All right. So, um, you know, I've got the structure from which they work and typically they work separately in their own chambers, but I want to throw a couple of terms at you guys and, and then we'll, we'll quickly talk about how they take a break because uh, they do that a lot. So, um, what you typically see is that they work respectively in their own chambers. Uh, going forward, we'll start to get into how they actually do their work of making laws and acting as watchdogs. But there are these kind of special meetings that they have that I wanted to indicate. There's something called a joint session, and that's where both houses meet together for um, some sort of special purpose. Often it's a state of the union. Uh, Constitution mandates that the president um, talks about the, you know, I don't want to say define the thing with the thing, but he's basically kind of giving a report card on the nation and talking about how well we're doing and identifies legislative priorities, often comes across as a laundry list, but they'll um, come together for that. There may be occasions where there's somebody significant coming and addressing Congress and they both get together. Um, there may be um, some sort of nat national um, crisis that they'll come together. So there are uh, provisions for where they meet within the same chamber. Um, there are provisions for when they've gone home to be called back uh, into a special session. And they often go home, just to kind of let you know. Once I've got them in office, I'm going to quickly talk about how they go home quite a bit. So um, there is a difference between them kind of taking a break for the day and kind of calling uh, an end to a particular, uh, you know, legislative day, and then basically saying we're done for the calendar year. So... I've not seen this terminology jump up, but I, you know, if there is, 
I'm always going to go over terminology if there's an opportunity, I suppose. So we're going to give you a little, uh, some Latin down here and just some other obscure language. You know, typically what happens is the House and the Senate, again, because of numbers, have a different way of kind of, you know, stopping uh, a legislative day. What the House does is they will adjourn to a day certain. They will end for the evening, and they will make provisions for the next day. Um, and if they're, you know, uh, going to do anything more than just kind of end for the, for the day, if they're going to take a break, you need to make sure that the other chamber concurs. So this is more about saying we're done for the day versus we're going to go home for a little bit. Uh, we're going to take a pause in kind of the work that Congress does. Um, the reason they're kind of formally ending is because they begin formally the next day. With 435 members, you've got to have a lot of organizational structures. You need a lot more controls. What the Senate does is they essentially take a timeout. They take a recess. They go outside and they play in the jungle gyms. I, I always think that's a great picture of, you know, all these senators kind of frolicking. Um, they take a recess. And what it allows them to do is just hit the pause button. And when they come back the next day, they literally can pick up where they left off. What you have here is kind of like a reading of the minutes, the, you know, the morning prayer, the uh, call to order, call to quorum. Here they literally will pick up where they left off mid-sentence. Um, and again, it has to do with numbers, the, free, the more freewheeling kind of nature. When they decide that this is not just kind of, you know, ending one legislative day to the next, but we want to kind of end uh, a term or a session, they adjourn sindine, which means they adjourn without a day. We're done. And typically what you'd see is, um, it, it's kind of crazy. They come in in January and they're done in July, right? Um, they don't usually use what is... Um, by law set up, by law that, you know, they have identified that that's about the earliest, um, excuse me, they, they're not supposed to adjourn any later than this. But what they usually do is there's more legislative work than uh, calendar days, and they will work well uh, beyond that date, unless it's an election year. And if it's an election year, they'll take a break kind of closer to that. You, you, you see the obvious logic? Why would they take a break earlier if it's an election year? They got to go get campaigning and they got to go get the money, right? Um, so this is just kind of the general rules of thumb. I thought that this was a better kind of thing to look at. That um, you know, when we're looking at uh, the, the current Congress, uh, you know, the House was set to adjourn on July 15th and not return until July 6th. Uh, excuse me, September 6th. Um, and then the, the House will uh, be in session from September 30th and then uh, adjourn into uh, November 14th. Um, so that they can do the elections. What it meant is in total, the House would, and it's an election year, was in session 111 days. How many days do you guys go to school? 180, right? This sounds like a better gig um, based on those kind of numbers. You know, teachers get, oh, it must be great to have summers off, right? Well, hey, geez, look at these guys. Um, I'm going to start directing. Did you know how long Congress was in session? Well, next time I hear about, you know, isn't it great to have your summers off? Um, Keep in mind they're doing other things. They're doing district work often. They're, they're never quite, you know, vacationing, vacationing. There's always fundraisers and, and other things to do. But they, you know, don't often do as much legislative work as you might picture. Um, what we're going to do, I don't have enough time for it. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about leadership structure. And um, I just want to show you something kind of quickly. Well, look what I worked on. This is going to be fun tomorrow. Who's the current Speaker of the House that just got uh, confirmed? And then we go like this. <coughs> oh. Do you know how long that took me? That I, Hours just for that little... Isn't that exciting what we're going to do tomorrow?